without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Chris. Please make him very welcome to give us the Electrify Everything session. Well, thanks very much, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, and it's also great to be working with panellists that I know and have, have supported uh, over the last couple of years, I think, um, and also with one of our key strategic partners, um, Colin from Earthworker. So um, just a bit of background. Uh, I'm the Managing Director of Reclaim Energy. Um, it's a CO2 heat pump specialist. We specialise in natural refrigerants. Um, and the reason why we've chosen to go down the path of natural refrigerants is because of the low global warming potential and high efficiency in terms of uh, reducing people's energy draw um, and also the longevity of the product and the performance of the product. It's great cold weather conditions. More recently, we've uh, just been announced as uh, a strategic partner for Panasonic. Um, we're quite honoured by that because we are the first business outside of Japan that Panasonic have partnered with. And this is the first country in the world that Panasonic have chosen to enter into um, with their CO2 products. So it's a great reflection, not only on the commitment from a quality brand towards the Australian market, because there's a lot of substandard products, dare I say, coming into the market, um, but it also bodes well in terms of encouraging other quality manufacturers to enter the market. And that's really what we're about. And I think as part of these community programs, the really important things is you, you want to try to provide really good value to your members, but you also want to provide great products that are going to last and endure over time, um, and they're going to give them long-term returns on their investment, and I'll let the panel talk about that. Um, so we're going to start with um, Kristen, you're going to come up first, and from Rewiring Australia, so please uh, make her feel really welcome, and um, I really appreciate everything that Rewiring Australia are trying to do in terms of repositioning our psychology and our headspace, but also government policy in terms of how Australia should be approaching their net zero ambitions. So, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, I was just also wanting to start, um, Heather mentioned it earlier, but it's the eve of International Women's Day, and I just wanted to acknowledge all the fantastic women that are putting on this event. Um, Heather, Juliet, <laughs> Thomason. I really have given so much time and effort and I also want to acknowledge all the wonderful women who are leading such incredible work on the ground in communities. Um, I think we're very indebted to them and I was thinking of my late grandmother who told me a long time ago that we need to fight for a world where women are in charge, we consume less things and the first people we listen to are our First Nations communities. So I feel like that holds true. So. Thank you. Oh, actually, I also would love maybe at the end of this session if all the women could come up and we could get a photograph of all the wonderful women um, working on the ground. So thank you for having me. Um, my name's Kristen. I work at Rewiring Australia. I also am one of the coordinators of a community project um, working in collaboration with Rewiring Australia, um, Electrify 2515. We're applying for funding to try and create an all-electric community in that trying to um, work with 500 homes to accelerate electrification so we can identify soft cost learnings and all sorts of things that would help roll out electrification at scale. That's an ongoing process and um, that's me I'm with my three little monkeys. I am down in Illawarra and we get around most of the, most of the way on our electric bike. Yesterday, Saul gave you a lot about um, why we kind of are on a big kind of campaign to try and electrify everything. So I won't go into the why so much, but I did want to just stress the, that the low-hanging fruit is the core kind of reason why we talk about electrification. It's the technologies that are available right now on our shelves that we can really get going. And we have a big job ahead, but it's definitely achievable. There's 36 million electrification appliances to, in Australia that we need to install. We're about a third of the way there. With solar, we've still got two-thirds capacity, so that's still a lot, a lot of extra capacity to get in there. We've barely even started on batteries and EVs. Um, we're about halfway um, with our cooktops and our, um, our getting off our gas, hot water and space heaters. But 
In Australia, every year we purchase one million new gas appliances still. And so there's a lot to do to um, curb that change. And this is you know, a really big capacity um, generator for our whole electric electricity market. And um, if we electrify all our homes in Australia, we can be adding around five gigawatts additional, mostly firm capacity, which is about 15% of the ISP requirements. Electrification is also a wonderful opportunity for communities. Um, yesterday, Saul talked a lot about the economic benefits that we identified um, just from saving on petrol and fuel co um, diesel costs in our community. But it's also about creating resilient, secure and connected communities that many of you here are really familiar with. And of course, what is the kind of exciting part in this new kind of climate solution, well not new, sorry, but in this climate solution, is that there's a huge cost of living benefit for households. And the bill savings are well over $1,000. Um, if you're including cars charged on, um, charged on solar, it's up to $5,000. Um, and this is not just rewiring Australia that thinks this. There's plenty of wonderful studies out there that's all talking about the economic opportunities for individual households. And they these are the messages that are really hitting home with consumers. But we do need to be smarter. So if we just electrify all our homes and our buildings, but we don't actually shift our energy consumption to match our key energy production, i.e. the middle of the day during the solar peak, then we are going to need a huge amount more capacity. However, that can be reduced if we actually um, used our energy a lot more wisely and that can be done through a number of ways but one key way is actually behaviour and this is one um, area that community groups can play a key role in. And as you all know we need to make it more affordable for everyone. Uh, everyone who has the financial means to electrify can and should but we also need to work out how we can do it for everybody, for all Australians and we think about that a lot in our work. So. The challenge is how do we make retrofitting and electrifying households and community buildings faster, cheaper and fairer? We like to approach it from a simultaneous top-down approach where we're calling for those big changes needed so we can do electrification at scale efficiently, equitably and rapidly while at the same time taking a bottom-up approach and so a raising awareness of the benefits of electrification showing that people actually want it, supporting them to do it now and empowering them to then ask for more. And by doing this at the same time, we're hoping this is how we can drive forward. In uh, 2515, we surveyed our community and to see where they were at on the electrification journey um, and they identified key barriers of each of the different appliances. And across all kind of six appliances we were surveying, um, the top two reasons across all of them were upfront cost and lack of knowledge and trust. And for those of you who were in the session yesterday with um, Brendan French from ECA, I found that really interesting. Um, he also talked a lot about that lack of trust, the lack of certainty, um, the confusion. He had that great kind of decision matrix um, up with uh, installing a battery. And uh, again, I think this is a really important role that should not be underestimated is um, what needs to be the emphasis placed on that communication and the education component of electrifying. So if we take the big goals of like we simply want to get Australians to want to electrify so therefore they can easily do it themselves, we almost need to take them on in a journey. There is a bottom part of my slide that doesn't seem to have, have um, captured but essentially people aren't going to jump into putting a fully electrified house if they haven't gone on some engagement funnel. And I would say that as community engages, whether you're um, running a group or if you're just you know, have a business, we've all got some key kind of mobilisation objectives we can start to think about. One is education, so to raise awareness of electrification and become that primary trusted source. Implementation, so to encourage and support and coordinate installations. Let's get on with the job essentially. But a really important slash powerful part of um, community mobilisation is activation, is to build our influence and our political pressure so we can start to call for those big changes needed. So I, and part of my job is working with a number of um, community groups who want to um, take on electrification projects of various 
shapes and sizes. And if that's you and I haven't spoken to you yet, I'd love to hear from you. Um, because there's a number of different ways that we can be approaching electrification in terms of households and community buildings. And this can go along depending on um, where your community group is at as well as where your um, community itself is at. And part of, part of my work is trying to help uh, community groups map their stakeholders, identify power influences, and come up with sort of targets and also um, activities that really best suit that situation. And sometimes, you know, we've heard so many wonderful um, examples of projects here in this Congress, and I just constantly inspired by all the wonderful work that gets done. Um, but, you know, I also, again, want to emphasise that, you know, we don't all need to jump to those really advanced community energy projects to have a really strong impact. Um, the education component and those kind of mid-level engagement activities are very, very effective and important in our energy transition. Uh, some of the examples, there's, there's a huge plethora, but some of the ones that I've just been um, engaging with recently, um, I've got a nice photo here of um, Sarah Reeve, who's sitting at the back, and she's from Electrify Canberra, and uh, Sarah, um, Sarah bundled up Chris Bowen at um, another conference and um, pressured him in for a meeting, which she did receive. She is um, meeting him shortly, and... Um, it just, and it's going to a great opportunity for her to talk about and the others to talk about the um, community-led electrification and energy projects. Um, we have the Zero Emissions Noosa. Anne was on the panel yesterday. They are doing such fantastic work up in Queensland with things like EV Open Days. Um, the Solar Alliance team, um, Christina is here somewhere. She's just absolutely phenomenal. They're doing wonderful um, solar ambassador trainings. We have the Jewish Climate Alliance are running induction cooking expos um, that are powered off their electric vehicles in communities. Um, there are VPPs with local councils happening. Um, all sorts of kind of wonderful opportunities and activities happening at a range of different levels and all having a really important um, impact. So back again to those two key barriers um, for electrification and if I go in reverse order, the lack of knowledge and confidence that the householder um, and consumers face is very real and is a really significant barrier. And I see this is one of the most important roles that community groups, or at least at the community level, that we can be playing. So we can be that trusted source of information. There's been talk about one-stop shops, and I think that's a great concept, but we can kind of almost get, in, get started right now to fill that void help streamline those decision-making processes, provide clear re resources in plain language without the jargon that people are, get confused about with local information, because that local element is key. A lot of people don't even realise that the New South Wales government has a fantastic rebate available for um, heat water pumps. It's about trying to localise and, and simplifying the messaging to assist people on that journey, um, connecting with local tradespeople, suppliers, councils, for instance. Um, the upfront cost, of course, is a little bit trickier, um, but a key part of that is communicating the running costs. We all, you know, if you go into Harvey Norman, yes, a gas hot water system is cheaper than an electric heat pump if you're looking just at how much it costs if you walk home today. But if you take in the lifetime um, costs of running those two systems, they're incredibly different. And that's when we need to start talking more about the economics of the running cost savings as opposed to just looking at those upfront costs. Um, the messaging about planning for replacement. You don't have to electrify your whole home straight away. It's at what happens at that point of break. It needs to be um, implemented. You need to change it at that time with that efficient electric alternative. Uh, again, information on subsidies, rebates. You can be... <coughs> lots of people are looking at bulk discounts, um, coordinated installs to reduce those soft costs. And a big part of it is actually advocating for solutions because right now things aren't as equitable and affordable as they need to be. And this is a key component of rewiring Australia's work and I am going to put in a little bit of a plug here that I'm hoping that you might actually join us this year in doing some coordinated um, advocacy work. And there's plenty of things we could be uh, calling for but some of the key ones we're working on is looking at concessional finance so how does every household have access to no or low cost capital to afford those upfront um, items? 
renter inclusions, how do we get things like mandatory disclosures, minimum efficiency standards, so um, renters and landlords uh, have the carrot and stick approach to electrification. Um, regulatory reform, I've got my wonderful colleague here, Vicky, somewhere, and she's very, very clever and, and looking at all the ways that we can be looking at our NEM and making it more customer focused reforms, looking at things like community energy zones. Um, how do we plan for the gas network? At the council level, and I'm sure a lot of you here do already currently work closely with your council, but there's heaps that can be done at that local level, both within the actual councils themselves, so whether that's advocating for your individual council to be doing things for their own operations, but also the way that they can be supported, supporting uh, community groups or working within the community to make electrification more accessible, whether it's um, working with their own kind of bulk buy programs, introducing environmental levies that can assist renters and landlords for, thing, for things like that. I think I'm at time, I'm, I'm getting the sign. So um, if I can do a final plug that Let's all together build a national electrification movement. Um, let's think about our roles of education, implementation and activation. But we should be clever about this. We should not do it in silos. We should be doing it coordinatedly. So part of the work I'm doing is trying to work out how can we collaborate with each other. So much wonderful learning is an experience in this room, wonderful resources that get, um, that get created. How do we share them so we can all kind of don't have to reinvent the wheel? How do we utilise the wonderful existing networks like C4CE, the MEH groups, the Renew organisation? How do we kind of all kind of work more collaboratively and, um, as I mentioned, have some more coordination in our advocacy asks so we can get those big changes to ne to n that we need. So I will leave it there, but thank you very much. Um, and I, finally, if you are a community group and um, would like to work more on electrification, then please come and see me. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was awesome. I mean, I think the energy that Rewiring Australia bring to the market is phenomenal. And they're definitely getting the attention, not only the politicians, but the broader marketplace. And that's really where we're going to see this grassroots movement. I loved your point about trusted, like trust being a massive issue. There's so much information out there that a lot of people are getting very confused. I actually encourage each of you to talk to each other, the people who've already run bulk buy programs or successful community programs about why they went down certain paths, why they chose certain partners to work with, what their criteria were and what the outcome has been um, and what roadblocks they ran into. Because at the end of the day, um, people who are selling products are there to sell products. And your job is to you know, support people to make the right decision for what's going to work for them. Um, Karina, uh, it, we've, we've worked together for a year, uh, believe it or not, and we've only just met today. Um, so today was our first face-to-face -face meeting. We've done it all via Zoom. Uh, I've been uh, unwell for a while. But Karina um, and her team ran the Geelong Sustainability Program. Uh, we've been involved in a number of community programs. And I have to say, it, it was one of the best managed programs that we've ever had the uh, opportunity to be involved with. Um, the way they, they did their prep work, the way that they managed their suppliers, and the way they partnered with local community was phenomenal. The take-up was amazing. Um, and the long-term benefits down in the Geelong region, of, I'm sure, are going to be exponentially realised time and time again. So. Karina, well done, and um, over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Oh. Few, more, <laughs> few more slides for you. There we go. Great. Um, it's so nice to be here. Um, so my name is, and thank you, Chris, and thank you also, Kirsten, for giving a bit of the overarching. I feel like a lot of what you said um, I'm going to also touch on a little bit, but... Us at Geelong Sustainability, as Chris mentioned, we have been uh, in the bulk buy community purchasing program space for some time. And uh, last year in 2023, we started um, to offer a more holistic program, which I'll go into. 
Before we do that, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we meet on here um, and pay my respects to any Aboriginal people here today um, and also would like to acknowledge the Wadarang people on the land that we run all of our programs on um, down in Geelong Way. So for those who might not know Geelong Sustainability, we're down in Victoria, just a little bit past Melbourne, and we've been around since 2007. So it's been a bit of a journey since then. I was actually there helping set it up back in the day and then went away and I've come back and as employee. So it's been a nice kind of cycle for myself. And um, over the last few years, we've transitioned from a volunteer-led organisation um, to paid staff. So it's been a big transition over the last little while. So last year we ended up offering the Electric Homes program and that essentially came out of um, offering various solar and solar and battery bulk buys over the years and going and hearing from our community that they wanted a more holistic program and that is where we came and we're like okay how do we bring to the community uh, a more holistic program and involve more of the appliances of the whole piece of electrifying and so that's where we ended up offering yeah, solar battery, heat pump, hot water systems, split systems and EV charging. The only thing we didn't include um, as part of that home electrification piece was the indu induction cooktop thing um, and our pieces that we really wanted to co uh, concentrate on was you know having quality <laughs> products as part of the program, um, local suppliers, and we also integrated in there a community donation piece, which I'll speak more to later. These are just some of our partners, um, and also we cover the whole of the Barwon region at the moment, even though we're Geelong Sustainability, we cover five LGAs, um, and our major supporter was the City of Great Geelong, who was our major funder, and then we also were um, supported by all of the other councils in that region as well. And we went through a whole process, which I'll speak to um, later, around choosing our key delivery partners. So the reason that we decided to do the program, obviously it's like we're there as a climate organisation to reduce emissions and help support our community as much as possible with this transition. And we're like, we really needed to provide our community the these tangible elements. And so that's where this program came in. Um, so it also, as I mentioned before, it came out of our previous bulk buys. So down the bottom point is um, the outcomes of our last solar and battery bulk buy, which is quite considerable and has had really amazing benefits um, for the community. So what our process was, why we got asked here today was to just share how we did it um, and some of our learnings as well, because you guys know these programs um, and maybe some of you are exploring the possibility of stepping into that space. Um, so to begin with, we went and um, we got the grant funding, which was fantastic. And then we put an expression of interest out around our key delivery partners. So there were the, the suppliers who were gonna do the, the installs and the products for us. And we were really looking, it was quite an extensive process. So it was months and months long of putting the expressions out, um, the key delivery partners coming back with their application and then going through quite a grueling process of um, choosing who would be our best suppliers. Because as a community organisation and not-for-profit, we needed to be confident to stand in front of our community and say, these are our chosen people. We trust them. Um, they're good quality products. They're going to um, support you and um, we can confidently stand beside that. And so that was quite a large process um, for us to be able to go through, but really important process that we stand by. Um, then obviously uh, selected our key delivery partners, which um, Reclaim was one of them with the hot water heat pumps. Um, but we also had RECV solar um, and uh, doing the solar battery and EV charges. And then we also had a local installer for the heat pumps um, and also for the air conditioning um, units. So we had three key delivery partners, as ideal as it would have been to have one main person who was doing everything, um, we did find that hard to actually find um, and because everyone has their specialty areas and we're also quite glad that we didn't because our 
um, interest level would have potentially been quite overwhelming for one supplier um, to be able to navigate. Uh, we then went and developed the offerings, um, working with the key delivery partners to provide a specific price and offering um, that they could hold for the duration of our program um, that really was um, something we could be proud to go to our community with. Um, we also navigated a community donation part of it, so we wanted to make sure that every system sold through the program was contributing to us being able to install heat pump hot water systems and solar onto um, a community housing project. And so we partnered our community donations partner ended up being the Wuthering Aboriginal Cooperative, which we were really delighted to be able to work with them. Um, and they, the installs will be happening on their community homes uh, over the next few months. We went on then to, you know, the, the marketing, the website development, all that kind of thing. So we had one um, stop shop in regards to the website that had a lot of resources, information about the importance of electrification, the messages of why people would do it, um, and our packages and who our key delivery partners were. So anything, any question that people might have was on that website um, and, you know, developed the marketing and such things. Another part at which Chris mentioned as well was that we were covering a large area. Barwon is, um, for us, quite a large area. We're a small, small organisation. Um, but we really relied heavily on community partnerships. And it's really essential because although we're a really trusted name in our community, which we're <laughs> delighted to be, um, we're also, you know, Apollo Bay is a little bit further down. And to have the, the local environment group and the the local councils in that area standing beside us saying that we are a community partner of this project, we also stand beside what they're offering, really helped develop that trust even further. And that was really important for us because as we heard just before, trust is one of the biggest barriers. And that's where um, the role of community groups and those local voices are essential. Um, and then we launched the program, um, which was a big launch in Geelong with 250 people there, and then went and did in-person um, events, information, education sessions all around the region. So there was like, um, I don't know, 18 or 20 um, online and also in-person events um, at different times of the day to cater for the different needs of the community to really get in front of people so they could see that we're not here to sell anything. We're just here because we're really passionate about this transition and we want to support our community and get the most benefit for our community as possible. And so for them to see our faces and go, okay, cool, you're not the salesperson, you are a community organisation really helped. Um, and then we, uh, yeah, marketing and media flowed throughout the program and um, then we had the closing of the expressions of interest. So one of the pieces of our um, electric, electric homes program is that it's not a rolling program. Um, for our region, there's very different ways of doing this and they're all valid. Um, what we've found works best for us is that we uh, find giving a program that has a set time that people can put in expressions of interest of wanting partake, to partake has worked the best. The reasons for that for us has been that there is the psychological part of um, an end date of having to act and put in an expression of interest that does seem to generate um, more interest and, and, and kind of push people over um, to actually putting, filling out that form and going, yes, this is something I wanna do. It also means that we can, um, with our delivery partners, they were offering us really special um, prices for our community as part of this program. And it's really hard for um, those partners to hold those prices for longer term because of the market fluctuations and the, the cost for them. So it enabled us to be able to offer a price that we also were really happy about. Um, so that's where we did um, the, the EOI closing. So we did August launch and then we closed at the 30th of November. So it was that five, five month period. What were some of the results? So we had over um, 1,500 uh, event registrations around the region, which was really great. We had 927 expressions of interest. Uh, multiple of those people were ticking multiple interests. So, you know, hot water and solar or what have you. Um, and then 
we're still in the installation process. So the final numbers are not here because we, we finish and then the installations continue to roll out for months and months onwards. Um, but at the moment, we've hit over 300 installations over all of the different um, offerings and we'll ha hopefully have the final numbers in the next few months. But we're really pleased with the response from the community. Um, they really felt like they were ready for this and the education piece, even though there was, you know, I think the 1500 event registrations was a really key part of it for us as well, because although not all of them went on to the expression of interest, another part of what we're trying to do is the education piece of our community um, and to reinforce these messages. So maybe it's not their time to act now or it's not in their capacity, um, but it is laying the foundations for these important pieces later on in, in, the, in the piece and into the future. And that's also like really important for us as a community organisation. So I've only got a, a minute or so, but some of the things that um, we just kind of wanted to share around things that we've found useful is that you don't have to start with like a big program like ours. We did build up to that over some time um, and we have been in this space for some time. Um, you can just start with one or two things um, and interest areas. Um, but also the importance of allowing that time to engage the partners because of the role that they play in um, the trust element and being able to stand really confidently um, beside that. Um, yes, yeah, simple website automations um, and a coordinated capacity. So the other thing that I wanted to share about our um, program is that it was funded predominantly through a grant and some other um, avenues, uh, okay. which allowed us the capacity to put on a coordinator, which was myself, um, for, you know, two and a half days a week on the program, which really helped us to be able to run such an extensive program. I know that's not always possible, and, um, and we've run them previously without a coordinator, but it really, if there is a way for community groups to do that, it really benefits um, the program and it allows just that the, ex the reach of it to become a little bit further because it is that paid capacity. So, and we're really gr grateful that we're able to do that. Um, partner as much as possible, community, 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 that's, the, you need the people who are, um, really have those networks, those reaches, um, otherwise we're just talking to ourselves again, which is, you know, um, not what we want to be doing. Um, and simplifying prices and packages. So. It's a really, com uh, the other piece around from our community was that it's really complex environment to navigate and um, what we, uh, outside of the trust piece was simplifying it and going, here are some packages that we've packaged up for you. Um, here are the, you know, standard prices of those packages um, with knowing that they can alter, you know, person to person, circumstance to circumstance. Um, but it gave them, ability to be like, okay, that's that's where I can start. And then, you know, it'll be in individualized from there, but it really makes it less stressful and complex for people um, by going, instead of going, here's a billion things, you can choose from this. It's like, here's three different offerings um, of standard packages. You can change and chop and change as much as you want, but here are something that you can start with to work off. And that's me. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. I think one of the dangers that, that we miss as part of this program is, um, or one of the things we overlook, is how successful they were at bringing different suppliers together. And so RACV obviously had a role to play, we had a role to play. Um, but through the work of Karina and her team, um, I think within about two weeks of us starting the program, we became part of Geelong Sustainability. So we were one team and we we're all working together. And so RACV had a role to play they, and they were outstanding in terms of a lot of the support that they provided to Geelong Sustainability. And then we had input with them and, and before we knew where we were, we were, we were all just working as one organisation. So I think, you know, one of the lenses that we have is we talk about the community. If you're going to pick partners to work with, I'd encourage you to actually look for those partners that are willing to take that step as well and, and, and immerse themselves in your program, understand what it's about and your intent, 
and then provide you with the support you need to get there, whether it be advice or whatever. But um, it was an outstanding program and um, I'm disappointed that I didn't get to go to any of the roadshows or didn't turn up anywhere, but I'm here today. So, Gavin, would you like to join us from the NOS? I've got Gavin Gilchrist now um, from our old stomping ground down in Balmain Way so, and Annandale, so he's going to um, talk to you about what we're doing in the NOS of Sydney. Gavin. Uh, thanks, Chris, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, you're going to notice there's a lot of overlap between what the first two speakers have said, and I think that's going to be uh, really, really helpful in terms of just hammering the same message over and over again. Uh, I just would like to make the point, um, Maddie from the Northern Territory this morning uh, told us how she had used just about every form of transport to get here, uh, including a boat, I think it was, wasn't it? Um, I only used one form of transport to get here, uh, a bicycle. So you are now sort of in inner west community energy territory. So this, this is where we do our work, anywhere from here west to Strathfield, about sort of 10 k's that way. So if you wanted to meet some of our members who've done rooftop solar, uh, just got to walk, walk 10 minutes that way and, and you'll find them. Um, so that, that's, that's basically where we are in the inner west of Sydney. Um, I, think, uh, I think Sally said of, uh, from Narrabri that you've got 44%, where's Sally? Is she still here? 44% residential solar? Yeah. Um, well, in the inner west, it's 16. So um, in Blacktown in, in western Sydney, it's 38. Uh, in Liverpool in the southwest of Sydney, it's 32%. So we're down at 16 that's basically the Inner West Council area plus the next couple of LGAs, 16, 17, 18%. So six years ago, um, after the last Community Energy Congress in Melbourne, which I attended and was inspired by, uh, myself and a few other people decided we would do something about it. Um, and, and in doing so, so we spoke to a number of community energy groups in New South Wales and Victoria, had sort of long phone conversations thanks to all of them. Uh, and, and the sort of process that I'm going to explain now in a couple of minutes is, is what we set up. Uh, I, wrote, I wrote down in my speech, so I, said, I wrote this before I heard the last two speakers, but what we're offering as a group is trust. Um, and I'll explain how, how we've delivered that. Um, the model I'm going to run through briefly uh, we're happy to share with anyone in terms of how we've done it. I think it works for us. <clears throat> it's quite different to what we've just heard in, in Geelong. Um, but we, we have a sort of three-step process. Uh, so people come to us and say, um, typically, I've always wanted to put solar on the roof, and I think I can afford it, but I just don't know where to start. So first thing I do is I send them a, an email, uh, which is a Google form and I ask them for a whole lot of information about their house, how many people live there, what they think their energy use is, more on that in a moment, um, whether they're planning on changing how they use energy, for example, are they planning on buying an EV, are they going to be electrifying everything? Uh, of note, uh, the last year people have really, really started answering that question, yes, I'm planning on getting off gas. Uh, we also ask them uh, whether they've got a sort of indicative budget for solar and whether there's any sort of particular products they have in mind. Um, usually they say no, but basically they, they give us an idea of sort of roughly what they think they want to spend. So I, I gather all that up, information up in a, in a sort of Google spreadsheet. We also ask for two other things, uh, some electricity bills. And the reason for that is twofold. One, what they say in my Google form that they use is often very different to what they actually use. Um, and secondly, it's really useful to get for our installers to get the NIMI, the National Meter Identifier, because that's a useful thing for when we actually get to putting solar on. Actually, there's a, thir there's a third reason why I ask for bills, because pretty much every bill you get these days has got a 12-month historical record, and that's really interesting to see what people are using in summer and winter. Um, and because, as Brendan said yesterday from the Energy Consumers Australia, our houses are basically tents, uh, rating on average 1.7 NATHERS, uh, overwhelmingly in the inner west. Uh, it's a winter peak because people are freezing in their drafty cold houses. 
So I gather all that information up. So we have three, three preferred solar installers, so a similar model to Geelong in terms of we've got a sort of network of just solar installers. Um, and these people we know, uh, we, we trust them, um, and I often say at our solar information nights, the one thing about all our installers is I know where they live. <laughs> and that's true, I do. Um, so that keeps them on their toes. Um, so I gather up the information, that the form, bills. I also asked for one other thing. That's a picture of the meter board. So we're, the inner, we're in the inner west of Sydney. It's, it's the inner city. It's no different to the inner city of Melbourne, uh, or Brisbane or Adelaide, uh, probably Perth less so. Uh, but basically a lot of old houses, Victorian terraces, Victorian semis, uh, early 20th century housing, 1950s houses um, with very old electrical systems. So if I get that picture of their meter board, I can often see straight away this is a house that's going to be a nightmare for solar because they're going to need to spend quite a bit of money upgrading their meter board. So I'm trying to gather all this information up. As you, as you can hear, it's a really hands-on process. Um, and that definitely won't suit all of you who are thinking of sort of moving in this direction. Um, so I, I gather all that information up. Um, I then flick it off to one of our solar installers. So we've got, we've got five at the moment. Uh, basically, take, they take turns with their lead. Uh, we insist that they go and do a site visit. Uh, no quotes over the phone, online. They've actually got to go out there, get on the roof, um, meet the client uh, and just work out what the issues are. Again, because you know, inner city houses are, are very difficult, are often very difficult to do solar for. So slate roofs, old terracotta tiles, chimneys for shading, trees, overhangs, shitty roofs that, are, that first of all need to be replaced, that leak. So there's, there's lots of issues there. It's not like we're doing solar on a sort of in a in Blacktown in you know, some 1980s, 1990s houses where they're detached houses, and and by and large the structure is intact. Uh, one crucial point in terms of delivering trust. Um, so once the installer does a quote, uh, they send the quote to me, I and I review it. So they, I get it at the same time as the installer, uh, as the as the client. Um, I then sort of do a review, so I've got a sort of standard template. Uh, I'm not going into huge detail, but basically, what's the system? Are the panels any good? Is the inverter any good? What do I think of the price? So I've done quite a few of these now, so I've got a pretty good idea of what a solar system, sh system should cost in the inner west. And I basically do this review. Um, so people are armed with the quote and my sort of independent review. But a word on our sort of relationship with our installers. It is an independent review, and the, the household is clearly you know, our most important stakeholder, but equally, we do have a commercial relationship with our installers. So they pay us a 4% finder's fee if they win the job. And that goes back into sort of a bucket of money. Uh, and as with Geelong, uh, we've got to the point now where our group can afford to pay me two days a week, uh, sometimes three days a week, and coming up to Christmas when it's busy, four days a week, um, to do what I'm doing. So <clears throat> the results of all that are um, not, every, not every member goes ahead, of course. Um, the leads that we provide our installers are pretty warm leads. They're, they're sometimes people who've spent an evening at a solar information night with us. Um, I've talked to them on the phone. Uh, we've had email correspondence, so they... They're generally feeling reasonably comfortable with the whole process. Um, we've got people who've spent uh, six or seven thousand dollars a quite small system, up to people. Uh, we did a system recently in, in Paddington, which was uh, uh, over thirty thousand dollars of solar and battery, and full backup capability and an EV charger. Um, so we're still doing the full range. Um, which, so that was quite an expensive system. So there are a lot of people in the US who do have the money to do this, but the problem they've got is they just don't know where to start. So <clears throat> we've been going for six years now. Um, we've done 357 residential systems. Uh, that's combined capacity of... Actually, I looked at the figures this morning, exactly 2.5 megawatt hours of residential solar. 
worth $3.65 million. Thank you. Um, but, but that's great, and I really appreciate it. Um, but we're still down at 16% solar. We have a long, long way to go. But as I say, and my committee says, we, we, we're all in this room, we do what we can. We do what we can with the resources we've got. Uh, we're doing between sort of six and 15 installations a month. Um, we've had no state government support. Um, we wish we were in Victoria in some ways, where there was sort of support for community energy at one stage. Um, as far as I know, there's been actually zero state government support for community energy, other than that one round that uh, Clear Sky told us about a couple of years ago. Um, we've done 31 batteries, uh, $402,000 worth of batteries, with a combined capacity of 368 kilowatt hours. Um, we also got into heat pump hot water late last year. It's early days, uh, but that's been... We've hardly done any marketing, but that has sort of been really quite successful. We've done 20 heat pump hot water systems now. And we've also done seven community energy projects on commercial buildings. So where I've been <coughs> basically helping, helping community groups put solar on. Um, so part of the money that we make from our commission uh, goes to paying for me. Uh, part of it goes for, to marketing collateral. And part of it, we've got a sort of commitment to put into a community energy fund of at least $5,000 a year. Uh, the most recent system was for Guthrie House, which is a halfway house for female prisoners in, in Enmore, just in the inner west, uh, predominantly Indigenous women coming out of jail. They've got nowhere to live, no income, don't know where to start. Uh, so we've put a, we got a $15,000 grant from the Stronger Communities Program, which is an annual scheme uh, you need to be aware of through your local federal MP. Uh, our federal MP is Albo, and his office has been really, really supportive of, of us. Uh, we've done three every year, the last three years, we've got funding through Stronger Communities. So we got 15,000 from that last year, and the rest of the system, which was about seven and a half grand, we put in for ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> a particular interest is we have our own system that we put onto a, a club in Camperdown in the inner, inner west a couple of years ago, it's a 36 kilowatt system with a 27 kilowatt inverter. Um, and we have a power purchase agreement with the owner. So we, they buy all the electricity that we generate. Um, and we've got a really, really good price. Um, and that brings in between sort of 12 and $2,000 a month, which is really, really handy for any sort of small community energy group. Um, my final take-home messages as we run out of time, um, keep focused, uh, a lesson I need to learn again and again. Um, I really want to get into the electrification of everything. Um, you know, we've done solar, batteries, and we're now doing heat pump hot water, um, but our, and our members really want it, but we, we just don't have the resources for it now, so we have sort of made the decision in the last few weeks, we're just going to stick to what we, we know how to do for now until there's additional resources. Uh, so keep focus, message one. Message two is don't be afraid to ask people for help. Um, <clears throat> people mostly won't offer help, but they will often say yes when asked. Um, one of our members um, who was very enthusiastic, <clears throat> an actor as it happens, uh, we asked him to help and he, he he's always comes to our information nights and talks about the marvellous experience he had with Inner West Community Energy. <clears throat> he came up with this idea. It's a fridge magnet. You can't read it from the back, but basically the tag is, do it in daylight. <laughs> and basically this is a fridge magnet to go on your dishwasher or your washing machine when you've got solar, because that's when you want to be running your machines. So thank you, Elliot, for that brilliant idea. Um, uh, my third point is that um, it's, a, it's an obvious one, but it's, you know, it's, it's worth learning again and again. Money can't buy you love, but it can buy you a lot when you're trying to run a community energy group. So the fact that we've got money coming in from that power purchase agreement and from our, our commissions, from our installers, means that we can, we can do things. So um, Felicity from Northern Beaches uh, yesterday afternoon showed us her little, remember her little sticker? Well, that's our sticker. So we're now so putting this on the fences of everyone who's going solar. Um, most people are happy to do it. So we're just in the same, the same sort of concept of trying to promote the fact that 
you know, people have gone solar um, through our group, and you should do the same. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. That's outstanding. And congratulations on all the hard work you guys are putting in. Um, I know it's difficult putting solar in, in that part of the world, having lived there for a long time, but 16% um, is nothing to sneeze at. I'm sure you'll get to 25, 30 in the next couple of years. <laughs> Lloyd, you going to join me? So Lloyd and I have uh, known each other for a long time. We've worked on a couple of community projects down in Victoria. Um, he's been outstanding to work with and he's got a, a lot of experience in terms of not only coordinating these programs but in terms of understanding different technologies that are out there. So join me in welcoming Lloyd and uh, let's uh, listen to what he has to say. Thanks everyone. Um, oh, there's Gavin again. Um, I'll try and be quick because uh, we're running out of time, but I really encourage lots of questions and come chat to me after. I'm always happy to chat about all the projects I'm working on. Uh, don't really need to show that, uh, but it wouldn't be a yes, Prezo, without a picture of the community battery. Um, so I'll quickly touch on a few of the projects I'm working on. Um, and like Karina touched on, very, very similar process in terms of how I design and set them up. Um, but we're really aiming to break down those common barriers that all the other panelists have, have discussed today. You know, confusion, uh, lack of knowledge, not knowing where to start, uh, those upfront costs and, you know, that trust, that uncertainty about installers uh, is such a huge one. Everyone keeps drilling it home today, but I think that's a pretty powerful message that needs uh, someone to answer, right? Um, Secondly, education is so, so vital. Um, you know, Energy Consumers Australia released a port report last year which showed about 15% of people were considering electrification. The rest aren't, and some people don't even know that gas is a fossil fuel still. Um, so it's easy for people here to um, get stuck in an echo chamber and think everyone knows the benefits, but truly they don't. Uh, so a lot of people need that education. Um, so the, our programs, what we offer is... Anyone can call me up um, during business hours um, <laughs> to have a chat and get advice and walk through quotes they might have received um, and, yeah, just compare what they should do first. Uh, maybe they should do the solar first before the hot water, uh, depending on how old their system is, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, lots of web content. That's either housed on an independent website, the YEF website, or council's website themselves. And then info sessions. I think it's, it's a really powerful one. You know, if people can come and see you face to face as well as meet the installer that's going to be in the home installing that appliance and shake hands with the person who's literally going to have hands in their switchboard. It really, really helps uh, go a long way uh, for that trust barrier. Um, and then constantly I'm calling back the residents, um, those that installed and those that didn't to see why they didn't or why they did, what could be better, what was uh, you know done maybe poorly, uh, trying to continually improve the, the offerings and the processes on the programs there. Um, so just quickly, I'll touch on two of our active programs. Um, we got an app new name for this panel, Electrify Everything program. Uh, that's in City of Bayside, funded by Bayside City Council um, late last year, likely to continue beyond that. Um, and it's really important that we're offering, you know, the highest quality products with leading warranties. Thank you, Reclaim and Apricus. Um, you know, installed by a pre-vetted one-stop shop supplier. So Karina mentioned the, the one-stop shop supplier installer uh, idea. Um, this is the first time I've run a program with uh, a supplier that can do everything from, you know, the three offerings through this program, but they can also do solar, EV charging, uh, you name it. So they, uh, they can do pretty much everything. And it, it seems to be working very, very well in the early days. Lots of people giving good feedback that it, you know, instead of having to develop trust in four suppliers, it was just one. Uh, so it really helped people um, connect someone with some, a partner that's going to be there for, you know, nine months' time. Because whether it takes people nine months to electrify or nine years, hopefully this installer can still be their go-to person uh, down the track. Oh, remember the person that did our heat pump? They were fantastic. Uh, let's get them back for our uh, heating system as well. So far, 205 registrations, uh, 100 quotes sent, um, and 33 installations thus far. And that's including some people that fully electrified, so got rid of all the gas in one go because of that one-stop shop uh, set up, like I said. So that's equaling $175,000 so far invested. Um, like I said, it's early days of this program, so I'm hoping for uh, some big um, numbers to come as well. 
So second, second active program is our Hume Solar rollout. Um, and why I put these two together is, I don't know who knows Melbourne very well, but City of Bayside is quite an affluent area, um, you know, quite high, above average income. But Hume is the complete opposite. Um, and so it's nice to see what, what works in the different areas. Um, so we recently, or well, last year, did a community survey for this program. Um, so you can see 109 people participated. Uh, that's people that came through the program uh, that installed or didn't. Um, and it's really encouraging to see that those three barriers uh, that I identified at the start, they were the most popular answers in the community survey. So, you know, connecting with a trusted uh, supplier, pricing value for money, and the program made a, a complex purchase easier. Um, like I said, a lot of vulnerable residents in Hume, uh, some people really struggling to pay their rates, struggling to pay their bills. So we worked with council um, recently to integrate a concession card rebate to any valid concession card holder. And that's allowing some of these most vulnerable residents in the community to install you know, small solar systems for as little as $100 out of pocket costs, which is you know, remarkably low. Um, and for those that are really struggling to pay uh, their rates and their, their bills, at least it lets them get something on the home to really mitigate that when these energy prices are, are going bonkers at the moment. Um, that is including the $1,400 no interest loan, so they do have to pay that back. But almost always the savings from the solar system are greater than uh, the uh, uh, repayments that they have to make to the government. So far through that program, 981 registrations, uh, 278 solar systems installed, which is about 1.3 megawatts of capacity, um, just shy of $2 million total renewable energy investment. Um, and so when we look at the community uh, emissions reductions, it's over 1,300 tons uh, every year, um, and also $270,000 in cost savings, uh, you know, in whether it's probably not feed-in tariffs anymore, but, you know, uh, energy savings. Um, just quickly, uh, you know, I also work as a consultant on the Bank Australia Electrify Your Home pilot uh, in partnership with Boom there. Um, so this is, uh, a, yeah, a bank running one of these programs, which is an interesting model to look at. Uh, that's the journey set up. Um, so they receive an invitation from Bank Australia. They go through the Boom platform to complete an assessment. Uh, they get rough estimates of what that's going to cost them, and then they're uh, linked to a, two or three suppliers through the platform as well. And our role in that is that trusted uh, advisory thing yet again. Sorry to be a, a, a parrot of that, but uh, it seems to work quite well. You know, people, the Boom platform does a lot, uh, but for people that want extra advice or, or might not see something for them in the, in the Boom platform, they can give me a call and we can have a chat. Um, so I got these stats from uh, Bank Australia just before coming up here. Um, you can see the largest driver is reducing carbon footprint followed by uh, reducing bills. Um, and yeah, no, no reward for guessing the biggest uh, barrier. That's the upfront cost of the new appliances as well as the installation, right? Um, so, so far 270 have used the Boom platform to do an energy assessment. Um, 98 have explored quotes and, and, and 60 have then requested uh, quotes from that. I think it's really important as well that I didn't mention in, in our council back programs as well. This education, uh, you know, just because they're not coming through the program, a, a lot of people will, you know, maybe source a quote and then go to another supplier and, and try them. So at least, you know, they're learning about the appliances and learning about electrification as well. It's not all about, you know, the results uh, generated through the programs, but uh, also about, you know, spreading that information as well. Um, and lastly, I'll quickly touch on uh, the new project that I'm working on at uh, uh, Yarra Energy Foundation, funded by Yarra City Council, um, titled Wired for Tomorrow. And we're trying to look now at that beyond that household level, uh, looking at what is uh, necessary to achieve an all-electric precinct. So, you know, credit to uh, Rewiring Australia and uh, Electri 2515 starting this whole mission. Um, and, yeah, we're looking at an inner urban setting of, of city of Yarra, uh, where there's a lot of apartments, a lot of renters, a lot of low socioeconomic areas. How are we actually going to electrify that whole area? Um, yeah, it's no easy feat. Um, so the context there, you obviously we're looking at ways to achieve 100% electrification. And for that, we need, you know, localized community energy systems as, and, you know, CER, sorry, that should be uh, updated to uh, yeah, CER now. But um, we need lots of that um, and much, much faster. And so what we're looking to do is develop and deliver knowledge uh, to guide future work in accelerating and replicating precincts, uh, electrified precincts. 
So what we're trying to uh, put together is a vision and a roadmap for the community um, and stakeholders as well, um, and then provide a report of recommendations to council how they can fast track this vision that we've created for the community. And I think it's so, so important, you know, we can do all the technical analysis in, in the world, uh, but if, if this is not embraced by community members, uh, nothing's going to happen. They're the ones that are going to install these things and electrify their homes and, and tell their neighbor to get solar and put a thing on their letterbox. So if it's not uh, embraced by them, uh, nothing's going anywhere. Just quickly, I know I'm running out of time, but what are we doing? Um, we've selected a precinct in City of Yarra to create this vision. We're now engaged or have been engaging with the community in and around the precinct um, and working very, very closely with the uh, existing community group Electrify 3068, formed off the back of Electrify 2515. Um, and we're trying to really present an example of what working towards an all-electric future could look like in the city of Yarra. And it was really important for us to pick a, a precinct that could be replicated across the municipality. Um, we're also working with industry experts as well, uh, not just the community, so look to going through an industry reference group. Uh, I think we've got one member here uh, from Ed Langham, who's uh, in my industry reference group, which is great. Um, and ultimately, we're looking to inspire communities across Yarra with an accessible, uh, replicable, and inspiring vision uh, of an electrified future. Um, so what's the impact, really? Um, you know, at the end of it, council will have a compelling vision uh, to inspire their communities and their internal stakeholders. Uh, to take serious steps towards electrification. And so the outputs can directly uh, guide community climate action and advocacy to further enable electrification uh, across the city of Yarra and hopefully Australia, right? Um, so I said I'd be quick and I hope I was, but uh, yeah, encourage lots of questions and um, come chat to me about any of the projects. Yeah, you can see Lloyd's doing some outstanding work down in the, the, that part of the world. Um, Bayside's a long way from Yarra, so yeah. yeah. So you know the, the lessons that they're learning from Yarra and the expertise is being lent to other parts of, of Victoria, which is outstanding. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it'd be really worthwhile you you taking taking him up on that opportunity to talk to him, either today or down the track. Uh, Colin, do you want to join us? So Colin is a partner of ours. Colin is from the Earthworker Cooperative. Um, it's a cooperative group that's based down in the Gippsland region. Morwells. More, Morwells, the factory. So we're um, big advocates of, of what they're doing and how they're going about it. They make outstanding stainless steel tanks. Um, and it'd be great to listen to his story about um, what these guys are up to and how, the, how, how they're making a difference to their members and also to the broader community. So Colin. Uh, thanks, Chris, and thanks for the opportunity to speak to you all today. And uh, it was, it's been fantastic, actually, today and yesterday, to hear the various speakers and to see and to be inspired by the various projects that are taking place uh, around the country. It is truly inspirational, so fantastic. Thank you to all of you for the work you do. Um, if we were in charge of the energy transition, climate change would be solved by now. Um, <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there eventually. We'll take over. And that's, in fact, what Earthwork is trying to do, is take over the world in some way. <clears throat> a small ambition. But we're building the aircraft as we fly it, which is a difficult thing to do. We've got one engine and one wing at the moment, and we're, which makes it difficult to fly. But anyway, we're getting there. A little bit of brief history of Earthwork. We're the odd one out here probably because we're a network of worker-owned cooperatives. So our workers run our, our businesses. Uh, and we, we date back for, to 1998, I think. I was uh, one of the founders of Earthworker when we started out as a, an, an organisation that was trying to bring trade unions and environment, organi environment organisations together to break down this uh, jobs versus the environment uh, dichotomy. We, we had a, the slogan back then, which is around uh, pretty commonly these days, no jobs on a dead planet, and we've been very serious about that for a long time. We're inspired by the, uh, the BLF and Jack Mundy, and some of our earliest members were in... Uh, BLF members at the time of the Green Band in uh, New South Wales and Victoria. 
And we're also inspired by Mondragon, which is the big uh, network of cooperatives in Spain, uh, which has a turnover of 20 billion euros or something. We're not quite there yet. Uh, but um, that's, that's where we're aiming for, and it's good to aim, aim high. I actually am a uh, trade union official. I work for the Victorian Trades Hall Council on climate change, energy and just transition. So this is, Earthwork is only part of what I do, but uh, Victorian Trades Hall Council supports me to, to support Earthworker, and that's because we are interested as, a, uh, as unions. The, the Victorian Trades Hall is the peak body for trade unions in Victoria, like unions in New South Wales. And we are, Earthworker for us is an example of really practical transition and just transition. And what we are focused on, both as a trade union movement, but as uh, a cooperative, is putting, the ju putting justice into the transition. Uh, and that's something that often uh, gets lost, in fact. If you go downstairs, it's a very interesting um, exhibition downstairs, and I don't want to badmouth it in any way, but what's going on down there is a lot of big companies, many from overseas, that are very interested in making a profit out of the transition, which is, well, good for them, whatever. Uh, we, have, we are acutely aware that the energy transition is underway. What we are interested in doing is making sure it is just. It is a, so we're trying to put social justice and worker justice into the transition, because if, if we don't speak up about that, the transition is going to happen it's not going to be fair. Someone did say in a session down there this morning, uh, it's great we've got all this stuff going on, what we really need is finances and the lawyers to get involved. I thought, oh, Christ. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last thing we need to get involved if we want a big energy trans, a fair energy transition. Anyway, I didn't speak up down there. I would have, should have, would have been asked to leave. Um, so that's, that's fundamentally what uh, we're trying to do. Uh, and this is just three parts of the Earthworker ecosystem. There's a couple of parts not there. We have a cooperative, uh, construction cooperative as well. Uh, they're building small pod size um, uh, constructions for backyards and so on. It help deal with the housing crisis. And they're also doing rent, small renovation and stuff like that. And we have uh, another um, cooperative called Hope Cooperative, which is a uh, cooperative of asylum seekers uh, uh, that is involved in supporting asylum seekers in uh, post-secondary education. These are the, the energy essence of Earthworker. The, the top one, Earthworker Smart Energy Cooperative. We do uh, smart energy advice, uh, draft proofing, secondary glazing, stuff like that, mostly residential, a little bit of commercial. Earthworker Energy is the one that partners with Reclaim. We make uh, stainless steel uh, hot water tanks and we wholesale to Reclaim, but we also install Reclaim systems with our uh, hot water tank. We're also moving into um, large portable battery systems. And can I make it, we, we use, uh, we do containerized and trailer sized batteries and we use sodium nickel chloride batteries. Can I make a plug for those? Because they're not, no lithium. You don't need air con. You, they don't catch on fire. Uh, they are better than lithium in pretty much every regard. And can I make a big, if any of those of you considering uh, community batteries start to think about an alternative to lithium? And uh, we're also looking to install uh, hydrogen fuel cell backup generators in our systems as well. Have a good think about that. No diesel generators, get them away. Um, what we have been working on in uh, the last 12 months or so is, uh, oh, sorry, I should go back to that one, Co-Power. Co-Power is an electricity retailer, cooperative retailer. Earthworker is a part owner of that. We don't own the whole thing. It is, a, but it's a cooperative of cooperatives and member-based organisations. So it's owned by a, a, a large number of unions, including the nurses, uh, teachers, uh, the United Workers Union, which does a whole lot of different work. 
covers a whole lot of different work. Um, the Uniting Church, a number of environmental organisations and so on. So we're an electricity retailer, uh, working in the national electricity market. So if you're in Sydney, you can sign up. Um, and we're probably the only electricity retailer in the world that allows our customer members to determine how we spend our surplus. We do that in a democratic vote. Everything we do is about our workplace and economic democracy as well as all the other environmental things we're trying to do. Uh, we've set up some th a, a one-stop shop. We've heard that a bit and uh, I, I should throw in the word trust as well. But um, one-stop shop, that's what we, we think is very important. We know... We, part of the reason we set up uh, the Smart Energy Cooperative is we heard about all of these great pilot projects and so on, but we like no more pilot projects, no more reports, let's do things. We know what needs to be done, let's do it and let's get it happening at scale. One of the things I think it would be great to talk about as a panel later is how we take everything we do as organisations to scale because we've been killed for scale by the people downstairs at the moment. So how can we work together to take th to what we, the good stuff we do to scale? I really like to think about that. So 3EA is uh, Energy Efficiency and Electrification Alliance. 3EA is a little bit easier than that. Um, we've basically brought our cooperatives and a number of, uh, we think, trustworthy uh, enterprises together to provide every aspect of household energy retrofitting in the one organisation or, and it involves our organisations, Enviroflex does installation, EcoMaster, very long term uh, in, uh, draft proofing company, now they manufacture that don't install, uh, Env Enviro Group does a whole, does everything pretty much, analytical engines as a consultant, we can do, so we can do from draft proofing to batteries and everything in in between with just one connection point. This is really designed um, to provide, uh, sorry, I keep looking at the clock, uh, to provide a, um, a one-stop large shop for large-scale projects targeted at low-income householders. That's what we're really keen on doing. So if anyone's interested in that, we're very keen to talk to you. Um, so we, and these are the sorts of things we think a one-stop shop should be able to, should focus on safety, customer folk. We don't, safety, we don't want any more pink bats type thing that has been disastrous for the insulation industry for a long time. Customer focus, social benefits, um, taking household energy to scale, energy and workplace democracy, good jobs and maximising the benefits of behind the, behind the metre energy. We like to think of energy as a service. What is the, what do, um, Households need, and let's see how we can, in terms of energy, and how can we provide that to them, uh, first of all, by reducing the amount they need. We'd be one of those few retailers that says, how can we help you cut your electricity usage, which we do all the time, and we provide the services through our various partners to help people reduce their energy need, and then how do we give you the, the residual energy you need in the most environmentally friendly way possible. I should probably wind up there. Um, I think that's about it. Yes, thanks. Just before you all run off and have something to eat, um, uh, we, we've found probably over the last six to 12 months that we get more and more inquiries coming through specifying that they actually want to work with the earth worker um, and that's who they want to partner with. Um, from end users and end, end, end consumers. So the message that Colin's trying to convey to you is actually getting out into the market and a lot of people want to get behind you and support you and that's why we're happy to be, or proud to be partners of yours. Um, we see that the legacy that you're trying to create and the work that you're doing with your members is, is fundamental to um, not only clean energy future but also in terms of that whole balancing out between profitability and also community from an organisational perspective. So thanks, Colin. We'll start with Gavin, if we could. So how do you ensure energy turnouts at energy information sessions? Like, so we find people not even engaged with energy, with everything they have going on. So how do you, how do you encourage people to come along to your sessions?
Uh, how do we ensure people... It says... Does green mean go? <laughs> I thought red meant on. Um, uh, look, it's always a really str a struggle to get people to come to an information night. Uh, we've tried a whole different range of models, but basically what we found is small venues that are fun venues. Uh, people don't want, definitely don't want to go and meet in someone's house. They don't really like going to council facilities because they're boring uh, and they're cold and drafty and just not comfortable. Um, so we, we have our information nights as much as possible in a, a wine bar. We've got lots of wine bars in the Inner West. <laughs> it's a cool place to live. Um, a wine bar, a music store, um, uh, places like that where people can come in, grab a drink. Uh, we provide a bit of finger food um, and it's quite sort of chilled in terms of environment. But even so, it's still, it's still you know, really... I said, as I said, you, know, we, you do what you can. Uh, we're still, you know, we might get, if we get 50 people, that's great. Uh, we're not certainly doing the hundreds and hundreds that Geelong were doing at the start of their program. Um, but we're happy, you know, happy if we get, uh, typically 50 people say they're coming, 20, 20 to 25 actually turn up, 10 actually install solar. Perfect. So um, how important have you found home uh, energy assessments when rolling out your appliance upgrade programs? Do you offer them? So does anyone want to field that one? Um, so we don't offer direct uh, energy assessments. It's more just advice that I will offer just with chatting with the resident. Uh, it would be great if we had a project to do home energy assessments. But um, yeah, I guess come talk to me if uh, that's something you're interested in. So Heather's asked, do we need to go further and offer people energy audits? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I'd just add, we would really love to be doing more work in energy efficiency. Uh, as I said, at the start of each individual process, I see people's bills. It's, it's two things are incredible. The enormous range of how much people are using. Um, I've got people, two people in a house using six kilowatt hours a day. I've got two people in a house using 60 kilowatt hours a day. Uh, they've obviously got a pool, but they've also got um, slab heating. Uh, but the people using 60 kilowatt hours a day have no idea that this is unusual. They said, doesn't everyone use that much? Um, so we would like to do energy efficiency auditing, energy efficiency work, but it's, it's, it's very time intensive. It's not easy to do. Um, uh, and it takes quite a bit of money to sort of just get the whole program designed. I just have something to add to that. Um, so our, for this year's program and like the second stage of the Electric Homes program, we're actually incorporating energy efficiency um, into it. So it's going to be an efficient Electric Homes program or however you want to say it. And that's going to involve those lower hanging fruits of the draft proofing, the insulation, those type of things. Um, and we're partnering with uh, Race for 2030 um, coming on as a research partner as part of that as well, which is really exciting but um, for one of our other programs that's outside of the electric homes program we partnered with um, one of the local climate groups and the the Queenscliff Council um, and they actually uh, created a discounted price for energy assessments because we normally do energy assessments as fee-for-service um, for people. We haven't been able to incorporate it within our program um, due to ca capacity. However, through this program, the council did fund uh, 100 discounted energy efficiency assessments for people and we found that that's been really good for bridging that gap um, for those who that out-of-pocket cost is a bit of, um, you know, a bit too hexy for them, yeah. Next question's for you, Karina. What was the grant Geelong Sustainability used for their Electric Homes project? Yeah, so that was through City of Great Geelong, which is our major um, partner, council partner of the five, um, and it was called a Climate Change Partnership Grant. And so that is also what we've got funded for this year again, um, alongside the support from Race from 2030, um, and that's, that, that's how we funded it, yeah. Gavin, this one's for you. Have you found installing solar PV allows you to discuss other ways to change energy behaviour or energy efficiency with uh, the people you're engaging with? 
has it has it allowed me to do that? Yes. Um, it potentially yes, but I don't really have the time to do it. Okay. So as I said a moment ago, you know, there's an enormous range in terms of how much people are using. Um, sometimes people ask me. I mean, sometimes I will e email someone and say, "Do you realise you're using quite a bit of power? Have you got any?" I wonder if you mind telling me if you think there's a reason for that. Um, but it usually doesn't go very far, the conversation. So I'm really more about just putting solar on the roof, um, starting the electrification journey, and hoping that down the track they'll start thinking about that sort of thing. Or we live in hope that there'll be some big grants to set up a decent energy efficiency project. Yep. Um, and the last question, which I, I might actually have a crack at, <laughs> look out. Uh, big difficulty in rural or regional New South Wales, which is where I live, is assessing subsidies for energy efficiency appliances. Most accredited suppliers serve only the metro areas how to fix. Um, my advice would be to go to the head office or go to the owners of the business or the managing directors of the business. So this is where we are, this is what we're looking to do. Do you have a trusted partner? If you don't have a trusted partner, can you work with us to find a trusted partner that you'll take responsibility for? Um, and then how can you best support us to manage the rollout of this program? Um, there's no reason at all, uh, I mean, the guys who have rebate chases will stay in Metro Sydney and do their free, like in my space, do their $99 or $33 heat pumps, which is a bit of a concern um, around a whole range of different issues. But from a regional perspective, I think, you know, if you find a local partner in town, as Gavin said, I know where they live, um, and he walks past the house every day, um, and they're prepared to... Uh, partner with a reputable supplier, whether they're based in Melbourne, Sydney or wherever, then get them to, to help manage that process for you. So, so it's not just about offering a product, it should be around offering the complete service. If, if they're committed to the community and the community programs, then they should be working with you to help manage and roll this program out. And can we ask Colin and the others about his ideas on scaling up all these amazing programs and the ones earlier from today? Which uh, well, I should just say first of all, we do assessing and all of that stuff as well. So, <laughs> um, I well, Earthworker yep. has a habit or a a principle of working with everyone and anyone we can who shares our values. We are not at all proprietary, so we are very happy to work with anyone. And I think that is part of it. Let's just we should be talking together. We should. I I, I would say. We probably don't need any more community retailers. I think there's probably enough community electricity retailers out there. Uh, so we don't want to be adding more competition. But I think it's about... And a lot of people here to already do partner up and, and do shared projects and all that sort of stuff. But look also to your... Uh, to enterprises and social enterprises, cooperatives and organisations like ours, look to ours first before you go to the big players to see if they can meet your needs for whatever it is, batteries or the various things we've talked about. Um, and talk about, let's talk about trying to do things together. But we also really need governments to uh, start funding at large scale the especially the upgrades to social housing and lo a lower income housing. And we need... Governments can do that. The, the Commonwealth Government has unlimited fiscal capacity to do that and it should use it. Can we... <laughs> just as a final word, uh, I just want to throw back to Kirsten about rewiring Australia to sort of close us out because I, w I was aware that there was so much you wonderful content you wanted to share and I'd love to hear your final... Final words on Electrify Everything. Thank you, um, Kristen, but that's all right. Um, so collaboration, I'd say, is really key. I mean, the, the amount of knowledge here that's transferable across communities is huge. Um, so I think that's a really important part. Um, I'm trying to demonstrate the success that everybody is doing and looking at, through that demonstration, advocating for this to be done, as um, Colin said, through actual large-scale funding at the government level. But if we can't demonstrate it, then it's not known. Um, but And also just sharing stories. Um, 
again, I want to just emphasise the importance of education and what people connect with is not a heat pump, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's the stories that go behind it. People want to know about the person, how they're getting the more comfortable homes, the savings they're making. So the more that you can kind of um, amplify community voices and their stories, that's what people connect with. Um, so to, you know, keep sharing those kind of opportunities so um, of, you know, a personal connection is really powerful. But um, I know Heather's really hovering to wrap us up, so I won't say any more, but can I put in one more pitch for we getting a female photo, Heather, oh, yes. of everyone? Right. So, Not just panel speakers, all the wonderful women and... <laughs> Excellent, because I almost forgot that. So, uh, women up the front, men get your cameras out. Um, <laughs> and uh, and thank can everyone put their hands together for the panel and for Reclaim Energy.